Okay. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I was just telling you that uh, I got this very interesting uh, forward from a non-medical friend. And as you know, in this pandemic time, many of our non-medical friends also are uh, keenly involved in health issues and the studies and all those things. So what he was trying to suggest was that the webinars are going on increasing, cases are going on increasing, the earnings are going on decreasing. But what seems to be stagnating is the doctor's knowledge. Um, so. I think uh, obviously this is not true. We have learned a lot in the last eight months about this virus. Uh, although we do agree that some of the uh, drugs that were approved initially, we are now having a doubt whether they are going to work or not. But yes, uh, the the point that I want to stress here is ki this is a constant flux. We are learning about a new virus, uh, which is uh, constantly changing. New data is coming up and we are trying to understand it more and more. And this is the reason why I'm trying to stress this idea that we are discussing this in the last week of October. And maybe a month from now, things would have changed a lot. So what I'm suggesting now might not be relevant about a month from now. So you're all aware the word COVID stands for Corona. So this, sorry. So this is Corona virus. That's what COVI stands for. D is disease and it was discovered in 2019. And the actual causative organism was found to be a coronavirus, which is now called SARS-CoV-2. Now, um, obviously we have coronaviruses. We've been dealing with them from a long time. We have the alpha coronaviruses, the beta, the gamma and delta. And the novel coronavirus that we're now talking about is basically a beta coronavirus. Now, if you look at the phylogenetic tree, we have the alpha, beta, gamma and delta. And actually the four most common coronaviruses that are responsible for com causing common cold are uh, highlighted over here. Now, it is in this beta coronavirus family that we are seeing the more dangerous one that are causing low respiratory tract involvement that are associated with uh, pandemics. The first one I remember still in the year 2002 when we came across the SARS, it was uh, the fear of a pandemic was palpable as I was working in a medicine OPD. And uh, we used to, you know, wear masks those days. And um, and more than that, I, I definitely remember the many presentations that I gave on this topic. So 2002-2003, we saw this uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome starting from China, from the Guangdong province, and it spread across uh, the world. Uh, and it was traced back actually from a hotel in uh, Hong Kong, from where international travelers spread it all across the world. And very soon, we saw around 8,000 plus cases with 774 deaths in a short period of time. So that is the first time we we were, you know, at least that I was um, aware of a coronavirus that was causing this kind of a pandemic. Um, around 2012, we had another virus coming up and this was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. And this was called MERS because it was discovered in Middle East in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And in 2012, it was found that again it was starting from the bat. Now this bat is coming up everywhere in most of these coronaviruses. What's the role of the bat over here is that the bat in order to cool itself, it puts a lot of its saliva on its wings and it flutters its wings. That's how it's air conditioning itself. That's how it cools itself. And this fluttering of the wings at high frequency allows the, the saliva to be dispersed like uh, in the air and that's how it is getting transmitted. So bat is becoming a very sophisticated uh, way of how you know many of these um, uh, respiratory viruses which are traveling through droplets, they are getting spread. Um, in this case, the MERS coronavirus was found to be going from the bat to the camel and from the camel it had mutated and then it had come to the human. Now, this uh, MERS cases are still ongoing here and there. We are still seeing re cases reported. The uh, unfortunate thing obviously is the case fatality rate is much higher than the current um, coronavirus that we are seeing. And uh, uh, most of the cases, however, were restricted to the Gulf. Around 2000, um, in the in the December January month, we started hearing about uh, a, a virus, a novel coronavirus, uh, first reported in um, in NEGM, and then it came obviously in many other places also. And around Jan, we had a good idea that this is a coronavirus. It is causing lower respiratory tract infection. It is causing pneumonia, and it brought back the um, memories of what we saw in the SARS coronavirus in 2002. And things spread very rapidly. Our grandparents had not seen it. Our parents had not seen it. We were witness to history in the making. And you could see that starting from December 2000, um, in uh, December 31, 2019, how rapidly the sequence of events occurred. Very soon it had spread across China uh, in the Wuhan city where, uh, from a wet market where it started. And it was first case was, was declared, fatal case was declared in Jan 11. 
it had spread to korea nepal japan within a few months although wuhan was shut down by jan 23rd itself but by that time it had gone out because of the international travel and the first case in india was reported in on jan 30 so if you look at the stage of any pandemic uh, obviously you know the starting point and here also it was the hunan wet market which happened to be the the initiator and um, these dark boxes that you're seeing this is in the market area the people who got infected and all these light boxes which you're seeing actually are um, outside the market that is in the city as it was spreading so again it was the bat that was playing a central role in this and from the bat the virus had uh, um, this is one of the theory that we have that is gone to the pangolin and from there it had got the uh, necessary mutations to involve the human so um again um just like how we saw in the sars virus um, here also we are seeing that it is spread and this is a sequence i was telling you that uh, december 20 before that we know we had no idea about this kind of uh, virus uh, by jan 10 it had uh, been uh, identified diagnostic tests were developed in jan 12 so uh, one of the advantages of having been exposed to the sars virus earlier we were much better aware and much uh, the developments happened much more faster at this time around and india as i was telling you the first case of coronavirus was uh, found in kerala in um, in jan 30 and by march 11th who declared this as a pandemic and now what we are seeing the reality is that uh, more than uh, 39 million cases all over the world and what's unfortunate is if you look um, india is right on top and uh, it's second and um, this is uh, taking into consideration the the fact that the number of cases reported in india are uh, definitely going to be lesser because many states are not doing adequate testing so in all probability we might be having the highest number of cases and if not we'll be overtaking us very soon so this is where we stand and obviously we know that it is spreading through the close contact through airborne you have micro droplets you have larger droplets uh, you have fomites and in all these ways this is how it is spreading um if you look at the r not this is uh, each person on an average how many people he is able to infect and spread um the x axis over here is the spreadability this is the r not and on the y axis what you are seeing is the um, mortality rate the case fatality rate so how dangerous or how virulent is the virus notice that definitely mers virus is much more dangerous ebola is much more spanish flu was much more uh, the sars cov2 is much lesser in that sense but then it's uh, r not is somewhere between uh, 2 to 2.5 is what we are saying each person on an average uh is going to spread to around 2 to 2.5 people notice that this is way less than measles measles the spreadability is very very high um but uh, unlike mers the spreadability is much more than mers in sars coronavirus 2 so what we are worried about is we have seen sars coronavirus 1 we have seen we are going through the sars coronavirus 2 imagine if there is um, a sars coronavirus 3 um which has the spreadability of measles and the virulence and the case fatality rate of ebola so that combination obviously is going to be pretty dangerous now we had got exposed to the sars virus earlier the mers virus uh, earlier what was so different about the covid 19 that it's spreading so much because sars did not spread that much neither mers spread that much but what made covid 19 that um, you know um, problematic was this very important idea that the patients were in both sars and mers the spreadability was occurring only in in people who are symptomatic so once people become symptomatic then they take precautions they don't go out they are more restricted and generally the spreadability starts decreasing unlike that the peak spreadability of covid 19 we are uh, considering is on day 0 that is when the symptoms start and actually one or two days before that and this is the reason why it is very difficult to control this virus because for example if if i am um, talking to somebody now and i am totally healthy right now but i might be having the virus i might be spreading it tomorrow day after i might feel a throat pain then i start feeling the fever and then the things are, start but then i am already spreading it so the point that i'm trying to tell you is that one important graph if you understand then you'll know why wearing masks wearing the distances having the hand sanitizers all those make sense is because the spreadability that is come this is uh, from nature as you know the index value of nature is very very high and what they are trying to tell is the peak time when the virus is spreading is just before the symptoms start so about one or two days before uh, even before the patient start developing fever or cough or any you know symptoms the patient is already the person is already spreading the virus and this is the reason why this is becoming such a big problem and it is spreading uh, so rapidly so 
obviously the virus has been detected in uh, so many secretions uh, the most important obviously the uh, aerosolized that is the droplets but uh, apart from that it is found in the sputum the saliva the stools blood conjunctiva uh, vertical transmission has been documented recently uh, it's supposed to be there in domestic animals like cats and dogs or dogs however there have been no reports of uh, a virus spreading from the animals to humans at least the domesticated uh, pets the significance of the other secretions and what role they have in causing spread of the virus is still not clarified we also know that the virus is viable uh, but if you look at it compared to the amount of time it spreads and uh, spends in the air where it gets uh, rapidly decayed every hour the uh, viability of the virus seems to be much more on plastic and stainless steel so this is just the half life i'm showing you just a comparison that compared to air if you'll see copper is slightly more than cardboard stainless steel and obviously plastic has got a uh, very high um, uh, half life where the virus might be viable for longer time although we are now understanding that many times even though the virus is there it may not be replicating rapidly and it may not be um, that viable for it to cause infection so however precautions should be taken that um, um, whenever we are dealing with uh, anything connected to cardboard especially infected patients who are hospitalized or who are at home then uh, definitely precautions have to be taken to ensure that it's not spreading through some of these fomites so although i'm sure it has been covered in the past the pathophysio part of it uh, but i i just want to highlight a few issues connected to the pathophysio and a few points connected to the virus before we start discussing about the medicine now the word uh, corona stands for um, uh, the garland or wreath and this is uh, interesting because wreath is where you keep you know what you keep for the funerals yeah. so this is the word corona i hope all of you are able to see my slides Yes. Uh, so the word uh, corona, as I was telling you, means wreath, which they keep at the funerals, and um, that's an interesting term that they use for this. And anyway, corona also means a crown, and uh, the spikes that are there on these viruses uh, make it uh, get that name. And as I was telling you about the various corona viruses, some of them come causing common cold, and the three ones that we are uh, we saw that are uh, creating the lower respiratory tract involvement. Anyway, as far as the corona virus uh, two is concerned. it is around 220 uh, nanometers uh, it spreads by attaching to the ac2 receptor uh, it has got uh, the s and n proteins and incubation period is roughly between 2 to 14 days and generally 5 to 7 days is the median median range for incubation period so this is um, a, a virus that has got 13 genes and it seems to make around uh, more than 27 proteins and interestingly if you look at the virus what you realize is that it's got 30000 base pairs which is a pretty large virus comparing with hiv influenza rhinoviruses and other viruses you notice this virus is longer but then one of the things that we understand is that the this is an rna virus and it needs the rna dependent rna polymerase and we know that the rna dependent rna polymerase is not that accurate in copying the virus and mutations are known to occur and this is a common thing that happens in most of the other corona viruses that mutations are common and uh, making most of the you know concept of a vaccine uh, not viable but what we are seeing in this current corona virus too is that it, even though it's such a large virus it's uh, as i as i told you it's 30000 base pairs but it doesn't seem to have so many mutations and uh, generally the longer the virus the more likely it should insert mutations and generally the the advantage of having mutations is that enough mutations if they occur then the virus may spread but it not be virulent and it might uh, burn out on its own this is it starts having enough fatal mutations that it start uh, it stops becoming viable so that's the advantage of having more mutations but the disadvantage is obviously with mutations vaccine is out of question now in the current sars corona virus 2 from the time it was uh, found in wuhan up till now we noticed that the number of mutations are very very minimal giving rise to hope that the vaccine might work here now the reason why this is been identified is that it has got a polymerase and exon enzyme which is one of the things that corrects the errors so any wrong nucleotide being inserted these exon uh, uh, enzymes and protein uh, polymerases are correcting and this is the reason why you are seeing that um, the mutations are very few and this is the reason why we are having high hopes and as you already are aware 23 vaccines are in a race and we are already seeing many vaccines coming into the phase 2 phase 3 trials and very soon we have our hopes high that the vaccine might be a realistic scenario um the development that we have now the kind of uh, technology that we have we are able to identify the core 
pieces of the virus much better now. This is the, uh, the cryo EM. Now we are able to pick up the spike protein. And um, the spike protein is something that has been studied uh, in a lot. We know that the, it is the area that attaches to the AC2 receptor. And there's a zone that is, this is the virus part. This is the place where it attaches to the AC2 receptor. Now, interestingly, one mutation that is significant has been identified over here, known as the D614G mutation. And this in, initial virus that was identified in Wuhan and in China um, to what we are seeing across the world now, uh, in most places in the world now, the dominant virus that is there is this mutated virus. But then the thing is that this uh, mutation that is there um, is not uh, affecting the hopes of a vaccine because this is just a minor mutation. And we're still very hopeful that most of the vaccines are going to be a success story. Now, you all know, I'm, I'm sure in the micro part, uh, you would have come across this idea that the, um, the spike plays a very important role, attaches to the AC2 receptor. The temporalis 2, which is a protease, helps in cutting the spike and allowing the unlocking mechanism. And the virus is able to put its uh, nucleotide inside, the RNA inside, and that's how the replication starts. Um, the more I read about the virus, uh, the more amazed I feel of how evolved it is and how many, it uses almost one third of its genome in evasive techniques. It prevents being picked up by the cytoplasmic sensors um, and it prevents being tagged as foreign, prevents being picked up by HLA class 1 and presented to T cells. So it's got a lot of evasive techniques that it uses and that's one of the reasons why again it can um, it can successfully replicate and spread. Now you notice over here this actually uh, electron microscopy and you can see this kind of small vesicles. We are now understanding that the virus is able to create the small vesicles, pockets, in which it can replicate without being picked up by the sensors and without being uh, you know, shown to the T, uh, the T cells for adaptive immunity. So uh, when somebody asks me, Ki, is this a virus that uh, people have created? Uh, this is definitely a big no, because the more you read about this virus, the more amazed you feel how evolved it is, how sophisticated a, a system it, it is, how it is trying to evade the immune uh, mechanisms in many of the patients. So. Definitely, we know that in this virus, there is a significant role of understanding about the immunity. We have broadly, we have the innate immunity and we have the adaptive immunity. The innate immunity is the initial first line defense. And then the adaptive immunity kicks in where the T cells play a very important role in um, boosting up the immune responses. We have the Th1 response, the Th2 responses. Those are all the adaptive immunity. What we understand about the um, SARS-CoV-2 is it causes a transient suppression of the adaptive immunity. The innate immunity is firing on all full cylinders. It's basically the innate cells produce a lot of um, chemicals that are known as cytokines. And these cytokines, broadly, you can classify some are protective in nature, but some of them cause inflammation. Unfortunately, in certain segment of patients who in whom the disease becomes severe, only in a minority of those patients in whom the disease becomes severe, the protective cytokines are not coming out. There seems to be a delay in them at least. And the inflammatory cytokines are increasing and the adaptive immunity being suppressed. So the overall concept that I'm trying to tell you in, um, um, rather than going into too much detail of this is that the fact that the adaptive immunity is suppressed allows super added uh, secondary infections, bacterial infections and other problems to occur. The fact that cytokines are coming up uh, will cause a lot of inflammation and ultimately you will talk, we talk about something called a cytokine storm. So the immunity behind this is very interesting. Um, although if I had the time, I would have gone into detail and explained about the various immune mechanisms of uh, how the COVID-19 is causing problems in mild, moderate, and severe. But just to give you an idea that, uh, as I was telling you, that the virus does have a lot of evasive mechanisms. Let's say it infected this cell. And using its evasive techniques, it, it does not allow any clue to be given to the surrounding cells that this cell is infected. Normally, one cell is infected, it releases type 1 interferons that warn the other cells to up their defenses so that the other cells are not infected. So this is all part of the innate immunity. Now, in the oh. SARS-CoV-2, what it's doing is this primary cell which oh. has got infected, it's not able to alert the other cells. But the body is able to find a way, and this is mainly through the plasma uh, dendritic cells. These plasma cytoid dendritic cells are able to pick up the broken pieces of the virus. They alert all the other cells that the, the patient has got a viral infection going around and the defense is up and the disease is mild. In a majority of patients, as you know, that hospitalized patients in coronavirus is supposed to be only 5%. In that, the mortality rate is supposed to be anywhere between 0.5 to 2%, depending on which age group and which area you're looking at. So in majority, that means almost 90% of people you know that they are going to do well in the SARS-CoV-2. 
and uh, the disease is going to be mild in a significant number of patients. And the reason why it is mild is thanks to the innate responses. And the type 1 interferons are supposed to play a very crucial role in majority of people having a mild infection. But we know in some people, the type 1 interferon production is a problem. And in patients who have moderate disease and my, uh, severe disease, we know that the virus is not controlled by the innate, initial innate responses. It is able to spread. It is able to be picked up by the genetic cells, presented to the uh, lymph node, the T cells in the lymph node, germinal centers form, and antibodies are being developed over there. So basically, the adaptive immunity is kicking in in, some, in, in, in a significant number of people, and they still recover, and this is moderate kind of COVID that you see. They have some cough, they have some pulmonary involvement, but they start recovering. Unfortunately, there are a small segment of patients, and I told you this uh, category of patients, only 5% get hospitalized. In that also, the very severe patients we see around 2%. So this very uh, severe infection, uh, definitely the initial protective innate response are not working. The virus is able to spread. As it spreads, it releases a lot of cytokines, not the protective cytokines, but the ones that cause inflammation. And also it is a suppression of the adaptive immunity. And this is one of the reasons why we are seeing a lot of inflammation occurring in this condition. This is what we refer to as the cytokine storm. So what antiviral immune responses that should have been helping us in defending against the virus, they become the enemy, they become the problem. And this is the issue that we are seeing in these patients. So actually more than the virus causing the damage is the host inflammatory immune response that is creating a problem. And that is what we refer to as a cytokine storm. For a long time, it was not clear why in some people this problem is occurring and why in majority of people they are coming up with a mild infection or moderate infection in their recovery. Some light in this is breaking out now and there's a new dawn coming up. Science has published two important studies. One is about the type 1 interferon linked and uh, many people who are elderly, who are diabetic, they are, they are now identifying that there is a problem in the type 1 interferon production. Also, in a significant number of patients, antibodies against type 1 interferon have been found. So what plays a very critical role, type 1 interferon, in the very initial infection, the protection is not there in some people and they are open, they are exposed. When a virus enters them, then they are going to cause problem. They are going to have a uh, issue because the initial innate response are not working. The protective innate responses, they are not working. The inflammatory cytokines produced by the innate system is creating, go to create havoc. And the virus is able to replicate, replicate very rapidly in those patients. So at least now we're having an idea that in a minority of people, there is a germline loss of function in the type 1 interferon. And in about, and that was seen in 4% of patients and about 13.7% uh, of patients in people who develop severe. Remember this idea that only severe, not mild people have this issue that they have antibodies against interferon. So you and me, some of, some of us might already be having antibodies against type 1 interferon. And those of us who have this, we are not able to hold the virus in the initial phase. The virus is able to replicate more rapidly and it's going to cause more problematic, pro more problems. So, so at least we have an idea now at least in 20% uh, of patients, we are able to explain what is the reason why they are developing uh, very severe. Out of the 5% hospitalized I'm talking about, at least we have an answer now, ki what is the reason why in some people the virus is spreading like uh, anything and the defense system is becoming weak. So I think uh, in the coming months, we'll have more clarity about why some people are selectively picked up. And we, what we say is the biggest risk factor in COVID is the age. The older the person, the higher the risk of uh, hospitalization and mortality. So age is the single most important factor over here. But apart from that, diabetes, pre-existing cardiac diseases, and so many other things are also there that increase the risk. But now we are understanding that um, the occurrence of these antibodies against type 1 interferon and the problems of type 1 interferon mutation, the loss of function, might be a very important way in, in predicting about who is going to develop a severe disease. But as I was telling you, in the coming months, we are hoping to crack this even more and understand exactly why some people are selectively affected more. Some of them, younger people, getting severe disease. What is the reason for that? And I think that clarity is going to increase in the coming months. One thing's for sure, in the autopsy studies, we saw that there is an inflammation driven by the innate immunity. That means it is neutrophil driven. It is driven by macrophages. So it is basically innate cells. And in fact, the lymphoid system is getting suppressed. And you're actually seeing a lymphopenia in these patients. So you, you do see that the endothelium is the primary area affected, particularly the pericyte on the endothelium has got the AC2 receptor. It is the main cell that is getting affected. And once the pericyte gets affected, as you know, the endothelium is going to be significantly hampered. So endothelial inflammation 
is definitely critical. And what it ends up is causing a problem in the barrier between the alveolar and the capillary zone. And that is going to result in the interstitial pneumonitis. That seems to be the big problem in these patients. So in patients, definitely what you see is the, the alveolar wall. And you can see this is how thin and nice it should be. But in patients, see how thick the interstitium is going to become. And this edema and, and, and the inflammation that is there in the interstitium, naturally then the hypoxia is, uh, is uh, expected because the oxygen transfer across this membrane is going to be significantly compromised. Apart from the inflammation and the interstitial pneumonitis that is obvious in this condition and the main place which is affected obviously is the lung because that's the root of entry of the virus. So the lung is significantly affected. It is going to cause the alveolar inflammation which is interstitial pneumonitis. But one, one interesting thing that we saw in the autopsy studies was a lot of thromboembolic phenomena is found in this condition. Now how the SARS-CoV-2 is causing this uh, thrombo thromboembolic state has become more clear now. We know that the endothelial damage causes the release of tissue factor. This tissue factor is one of the things that activates the coagulation mechanisms. Platelet starts sticking to this. And once platelet plug starts occurring, causing thrombocytopenia, you'll also see clotting factors are getting activated. Another problem is the complement is activated by sars cov because it blocks the regulation, regulatory zone called factor H, which regulates the complement. This factor H being blocked by the virus um, uncontrolled complement activation also damages the endothelium and also causes activation of coagulation. Then we also know now that there is something called neutrophil traps that are there, this neutrophil extracellular traps. They actually are very critical in controlling bacterial infection in other places. They, uh, but right in this particular scenario, in this virus, these traps that are there formed by the neutrophils actually become a viscous zone where the slowing of blood and that also adds to the reason why coagulation occurs. So the clarity of why coagulation is occurring in this condition is becoming more obvious now. And as I was telling you that SARS coronavirus blocks the factor H. And by blocking factor H, which is an important regulator of complement, we are now seeing that complement is activated and that activated complement allows for more endothelial damage. And that's how the endothelial damage causes platelets to attach and the coagulation cascade is activated, uh, activated. The clotting system and the coagulation cascade is activated. To summarize then, if you remember a Vishaw strad, we have a vascular endothelialitis. We have various activations that is including the viral RNA, the neutrophil traps, the volvran factor, thrombin, fibrin, mesh, all these things are activated. And then also you have slowing of blood. So all these three put together, the stasis, the inflammation, and the hypercoagulable state put together results in the patient developing a lot, lot of thrombogenicity. So now it is understood that one of the reasons why you don't see typical ARDS picture in these patients is because of this thromboembolic phenomena. We're also understanding that in most patients in whom desaturation occurs, anybody with interstitial pneumonitis desaturation should have been at a lot of distress, but we now coin a term called happy hypoxia, where people have got a lot of desaturation but they come to your hospital walking, they have mild distress. And one of the reasons for this is because typically ARDS, for example, comes with a shunt phenomena. You don't get that shunt over here because the vessels also are getting blocked. And the reason why the vessels are getting blocked is because of the thromboembolic phenomena. So this is what you see in a normal person. Okay, I don't know whether you're able to see this. This is in a normal person what you're able to see, but in the COVID-19 patient, see how the pulmonary vessels are significantly affected. So this is nothing but the thromboembolic state that is blocking up the, the many vessels in the lung, creating a problem. So to summarize then, uh, way back in the early months of um, April, May itself, we had figured out that the virus is going to cause problem in three ways. One, it can be mild, it can be moderate, it can be severe in some patients. So in the mild, we do see the viral replication. Now you should understand that even in mild people, they are able to transmit the virus because the viral load is equally high. So it's not that only severe people have got high viral load in their throat. Even the mild people can have a high viral load, but their innate immunity is working very nicely. The defenses are working properly and they are able to overcome the virus very easily without going into a, a cytokine storm. And that's what you see in majority of patients who have mild symptoms. In some patients, you do see dry cough occurring, fever, conjunctivitis, and X-ray will show the opacity, the ground glass appearance. Now, in this patients, what we see is that it seems to be a biphasic pattern where the virus is there initially, and then slowly after that, the immune system is creating some minor issue, and this is the biphasic. However, what is problematic is the very severe state where the patient has more symptoms. The virus is able to spread not only in the lung, but involve other organs also. 
and uh, the viral load is higher in these patients, at least in the later stages. And the immune system is creating the big issue. And this is what we talk about the cytokine storm. So in general, now we understand the concept of what is happening in this condition. There is an incubation period initially, I told you, after exposure to the virus. And that roughly is around five days uh, in the median period. Now, after that, the patient start developing symptoms. Don't forget, I told you already that before day zero, when the symptoms start, the patient is already in a, in a mode in which he's able to spread the virus very efficiently. So initially, we talk about the viral dominance where the patients got the viremia the viral responses are i mean the virus is replicating very rapidly it's it's creating the problem whether viremia is there or not there in it depends obviously whether it is a mild case or a severe case so in most of the patients if you trace this they start recovering and the the patient is out of the problem by about 10 days generally you will see that the most of the patients have you know come out of the the disease but in, in some patients, you see severe disease and then you see uh, critical disease. In, in some patients, you, you do see the biphasic pattern where they become severe, but they still do recover. But it's the very critical patients who are going to develop a very strong cytokine storm that we see that they go into uh, hospital, getting into the ICU, get uh, intubated. They end up with severe lung damage. And those are the patients that are associated with higher mortality, the critical zone. Now, this chart is very important. This is one chart, if you understand, then we'll know that what we are doing, what we were doing wrong in our treatment and what we can do correctly in the treatment. In general, you can break up the entire process over here into a viral dominance phase and a host immune response phase. And this is the crux of understanding about the treatment because we have drugs that can hit the virus and we have antiviral drugs and we have drugs that hit the immune system. Now, when the virus is dominating, at that time giving anti-immune drugs, might be counterproductive because they allow the virus to replicate more and it in fact can be counterproductive. This is what we saw in the studies also. Like if you see dexamethasone, which is against the immune responses, if used initially, like say day one itself, patient got fever, started taking dexa, then overall the, the person actually worsens more because in the initial phase when the virus is dominating, what we need is antiviral measures to work and the immune system at that time actually is helpful. But when the immune system is going high, all guns, that is, you're talking about the host immune response dominating, at that time, the anti antiviral drugs may not have much benefit because in a significant number of patients, the virus starts coming down. And uh, for example, um, I'll just give you an example. We saw so many studies on convalescent plasma. Now, what is convalescent plasma? People who have recovered from COVID, they have antibodies in the blood, their plasma is utilized, and that is being used to treat these patients. Now, the timing is critical. At the time when the virus is dominating, definitely antiviral measures like convalescent plasma, remdesivir, whatever drugs we have against the virus, they work when the virus is there. When patient already has got antibodies against the virus and the immune system is dominating, at that time trying to treat the virus by giving convalescent plasma or remdesivir or any of these things are not going to work. The point I'm trying to tell you is, you have an initial viremia phase, you have an initial viral phase, and then you have a later host immune response, hyper host immune phase. In the initial viral phase, the antiviral drug should be used. In the later, when host immune response is dominating, drugs that are hitting the immune system like tocilizumab, steroids, those are becoming important. If you do not have proper timing, then obviously the treatment is going to be a failure. No wonder then many of the plasma, convalescent plasma studies that have been done, obviously is getting rectified now because we understand the pathophysio better. But uh, many of the uh, drugs like uh, remdesivir or convalescent plasma were not giving at the proper timing when the virus was dominating and they were not being used at that time. Rather, they were being used, already the virus load was coming down, the host immune response were hyper. At that time, antiviral measures may not have much benefit. So I think that's one of the reasons why we are seeing the studies are fluctuating so much. But now that we have a clarity of the pathophysio, uh, the, the studies that are happening in the last few months are becoming much better. So where does the virus spread? Obviously, the most important area is the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract where the AC2 receptors, that's the route of entry. But the AC2 receptors are identified in the heart. So we do see heart involvement. We do see the GI involvement, ileum and esophagus particularly, and the stomach. The bladder is getting involved. So cystitis is described. The liver is involved. So you do see uh, serum transaminase is increasing. So a variety of organs in the body are involved in the virus because the AC2 receptors are present, not just in the lung, but in many places outside the lung. 
if you look at the typical clinical manifestations uh, one of the uh, studies were showing that you have fever as the most common presenting feature but uh, one of the negm articles that came out looking at 1000 patients in the in the month of march itself and it showed that fever is not a absolute feature almost 30 to 40% of patients in their series do not have fever at all so there's no sacrosanct feature over here that it has to be there to make the diagnosis but we look at a combination of features so you have fever you have cough fatigue anorexia shortness of breath myalgia but then some special features that are kind of unique to this virus and that is the loss of smell the taste alteration those things are also going to give us a clue left eye conjunctivitis has been identified to be a peculiar thing seen commonly in patients with covid So the severe COVID patients are going to develop the bigger problems, and this is uh, the pneumonitis I was telling you going into ARDS. Uh, you have hyperinflammation occurring, resulting in uh, fever and other manifestation inflammation. Uh, acute cardiac injury is becoming a huge issue. Kidney injury, neurological problems, hypercoagulopathy, as I told you, and then in children we are talking about a multi-inflammatory uh, syndrome, which I'll talk about later. One of the peculiar things we're seeing is something called COVID toes. and it's now becoming clear that this covid toes is because of the microangiopathy that is occurring because of the thromboembolic phenomena and that is one of the explanations given as to why this kind of um, toes are seen in these patients so moving to diagnosis uh, the diagnosis of sars cov 2 depends on three main aspects one is the rt pcr which is picking up the genetic material of the virus amplifying it and picking it up then you have the antigen tests which are the more rapidly uh, you know uh, rapid tests or what we call rapid antigen tests uh, they are cheaper but they don't have the sensitivity of the rt pcr and then you have the antibody tests obviously you understand the antibody tests are not going to have a role in the diagnosis of acute covid 19 because uh, the antibodies take time to become positive and they usually start becoming significant about 2 weeks to 3 weeks after the patient start developing the infection and obviously antibody has a very important role in finding out the number of people who are already got infected now as i was telling you rt pcr is the most important thing and uh, if the virus is plenty then the machine does not need to amplify many cycles to pick up the virus so a low ct value actually indicates that the machine did not have to amplify a lot already virus was plenty and the diagnosis was done so a low ct means the viral load is more the more amplifications are needed to pick up the material genetic material that means the number of viral copies in the in the nasopharynx must have not been much so the higher the ct value obviously means that the viral load was not that high now uh, as you can see the way the rt pcr is being done how deep they need to go um, the sensitivity is varying part of the reason why the sensitivity is varying anywhere between 60 to 90% is because if you don't go deep inside and take the sample from the right place then you might actually not get the test positive this explains why some patients are going to one place getting a test done and then going to another place getting a test done once it's coming positive another is coming negative Uh, the reason for that is part of it is sampling errors part of it is uh, how much sample how much it, uh, you know the copies we were able to get so a lot of things uh, are involved in why the sensitivity is varying but then it can vary anywhere between 60 to 90% as i was telling you no doubt rt pcr is very specific specific now there is something called pooled rt pcr this is all household contacts if you want to look at bulk level if you want to and this is cost cutting measure obviously but it's one of the things that is approved and what we do is ki many of the contacts that the patient had take everybody sample feed it in the machine at the same time and if the, if the test comes negative then more or less you can say that most of the people who are in contact were not infected if the test comes positive then you have to individually test each person because uh, one of them has to have the infection then we have the rapid antigen test i was telling you it is definitely cheaper it is faster it's as specific or highly specific as rt pcr but the sensitivity is lesser but you need to understand that a lesser sensitive test doesn't mean anything bad it actually it might be beneficial those states which are doing rapid antigen tests you will find that their controlling measures are even better so you can see a very nice uh, picture the graph that you can see here so obviously you would want to pick up the virus at the lowest level even 10 viral copies you want to pick up that's highly sensitive test but a less sensitive test like rapid antigen test can pick up let's say at a at 1000 viral copies the thing about the virus that we have is that the sars cov 2 doesn't take much time to go from 10 copies to 1000 copies to 100000 copies it's a matter of few hours before it is going to you know multiply so the gap that you get which is marked by this red zone is very narrow unless you are hitting it in that very you know red zone you don't have to worry even if you have a less sensitive test you are you are you are going to be fairly good because when the virus becomes infective at the point when it is spreadable and you have 100000 copies and all that 
then the rapid antigen test also picks it up rt pcr also picks it up now you might argue what if the patient is uh, viral the viral load starts coming down and a majority of mild patients we know the viremia comes i mean the viral load starts coming down and after some time you notice this yellow zone where the rapid antigen test can't pick it up but the rt pcr would have picked it up now again because the viral copies are so less you know that it is not going to be spreadable so because it is not going to spread because of the viral load being so low then we don't have to worry the point that you need to understand is the difference between the rapid antigen test and the rt pcr is given by the red zone and the yellow zone the yellow zone doesn't matter to us because anyway the virus is not going to spread because the number of copies are so low it's not spreadable then what matters is actually the red zone and that is too small a uh, thing so actually you'll notice then the rapid antigen test might be highly beneficial even though it's less sensitive that less sensitivity might actually be a benefit in uh, doing it because getting a test rapidly cheaper test it definitely going to be more productive and more useful proning now in awake patient before they get mechanically intubated and sedated before that when the person is conscious and he's awake and he's on in a high flow nasal cannula or niv then the method that they're describing is 30 minutes to 2 hours patient should be lying flat 30 minutes to 2 hours patient should be right lateral then again left lateral then uh, you know sitting up position either using the head raising technique so basically we keep on changing the body posture and this is found to be highly beneficial and there are enough studies now showing that this technique is a very essential treatment plan in patients with severe uh, ARDS in SARS-CoV-2 now once you decide to ventilate the patient then you follow the typical ARDS protocols that is you calculated the the weight of the patient based on the height so based on the height of the person you calculate the predicted body weight and through that we calculate the tidal volume that is roughly around 6 ml per kg um, generally we go for volume cycle and take care that the patient's plateau pressure is left kept below 30 cm what is this p plat we talk about every time this p plat actually tells you how much is the pressure the alveoli is bearing and if the alveoli is taking too much load then it causes alveolar damage and barotrauma occur so p plat is a method which which we use by getting an inspiratory pause we come to know how much load is there on the alveoli and as long as less than 30 cm of water then we are not creating too much barotrauma any time the p plat is high you have to come down on the tidal volume saturation as i told you we have to keep it anywhere between 88 to 90 Uh, two um, the peep setting and fio2 clear uh, tables are there now for us to adjust them and uh, as i was telling you if the peep plat is high you have to come down on the tidal volume if the peep plat is low you have to increase on the tidal volume other techniques are there where we optimize the peep we increase we use neuromuscular blockade we use a uh, pressure controlled mode and so many other methods are still there but the typical one that we follow is the what we use in non cov2 patients also the same ards protocols are applicable here and that is generally what we go is for the volume cycle uh, uh method and this is the the chart that explains the typical management of patients with ards we go for lung protective ventilation that is low tidal volume uh, we are going to go for uh, peep more than 5 cm of water initially and then slowly increase the peep um based on the po to fio to the pf ratio is nothing but the po to fio to ratio so each po to fio to ratio we keep doing the modification but what you notice here is the prone positioning is kept higher up less than 150 uh, the only difference between the typical ards and a sars cov2 is prone positioning started initially itself even before you intubate the patient the proning kind of starts and we are very early in 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 starting proning position in patients with sars cov2 in general i was telling you the initial viral load is there and then you have the host inflammatory response don't use antiviral treatment when you have host inflammatory response don't use anti inflammatory drug in the viral response phase so there is a right time for everything for example there's a there's a clear place where there when you have to use convalescent plasma remdesivir monoclonal antibodies they are all antiviral now you might ask if they are all antiviral why don't we use them when the viral load is there then the reason why we don't use them when the viral load is there is because majority of patient don't need any treatment when they have mild disease they're going to recover so how do you know that they need treatment in the first place so once the patient starts desaturating once the patient needs hospitalization once the c reactive protein starts increasing that's when your treatments like antiviral drugs start becoming important now delaying the antiviral drugs like remdesivir or clonazepam plasma or monoclonal antibodies too late is going to be useless because by that time anyway the virus is going to come down what benefit will you get if you use remdesivir in this phase because already the virus is not there and patient already has got antibody against the virus and you are giving convalescent plasma doesn't make sense at all so the timing is critical and definitely what is showed benefit is starting from stage 2a itself steroids 
are definitely a big important treatment. Apart from that, the anticoagulation, typically what we use is uh, low molecular heparin. You can also use unfractionate heparin. So anticoagulation and steroids become the mainstay. And um, um, in the later stages, when you have the cytokine storm building up, then there's a role of hitting the immune system more by using drugs that are against anti interleukin 6 like tocilizumab and sarilumab and other drugs. So in general, the antiviral drugs that we have are those that prevent entry. And this uh, one of the drugs that started initially with a lot of promise but fizzled out is camostat. And then you have membrane fusion um, drugs that inhibit the membrane fusion, uh, hydroxychloroquine. Unfortunately, these hydroxychloroquine and uh, uh, the other drugs, they are... Um, they are showing benefit in vitro, but um, study was I'll show you what the scenario is. Then you have the antiviral drugs hitting the viral proteases, lopinavir and ritonavir, and then RNA dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor, remdesivir and favipravir. Now, uh, I just give you the mechanism over there, but that doesn't mean that's what we use. Uh, I'll just show you what the studies are and the current evidence-based uh, uh, studies that are there. Now, the important one is the recovery study. And it showed that definitely steroids are showing decrease in mortality. In fact, at least the only one that we have of all the drugs that we have in our armamentarium that is showing, apart from supportive care, that is showing mortality benefit. So, but then again, it should not be used before the patient's desaturating. And it should not be used in the initial viral phase where immune system actually is beneficial. So dexamethasone has a role in the patient who start developing severe and the critical phase. The thing about remdesivir, it started with a lot of promise. Um, the initial uh, study from Nature was um, was really uh, very interesting. It showed that in the macaque monkeys, this animal study actually, in the macaque monkeys, the remdesivir significantly decreased the SARS-CoV-2 levels in the lung, although it did not decrease that in the throat, meaning the nasopharynx, the load was still there, but where it mattered, the lung, the vi viral load was decreased in the macaque monkeys. Then came the human trial in this ACT trial, the ACT trial, which showed that the duration of hospitalization was lesser with use of remdesivir and it, it that means it was coming out as one thing that was positive but unfortunately the more recent study uh, by who the who solidarity trial this um, concluded that there's no benefit to remdesivir and the solidarity trial actually looked at not only remdesivir but they looked at hydroxychloroquine lopinavir interferon and they said that none of them are showing benefit uh, in the randomized controlled trial in patients with cov2 now uh, the the manufacturers of remdesivir are coming out against this saying that the timing of where the drugs were given was not appropriate. This is not a peer reviewed study and uh, still people have to look at it. So, I mean, this came out very recently. We still have to get the, you know, things sorted out. And many people that we are seeing practicing in Bangalore and many places in India, including in Ames and other places, do say that their observations are remdesivir is working. Now, obviously what we follow is scientific evidence-based stuff where we have randomized controlled trials. They are the most important for us. Uh, as far as the RCTs are concerned, um, at least the solidarity trial did not show benefit. So there's a conflicting picture here that the initial studies, which are RCT as ACT is an RCT study, it showed benefit, but the solidarity trial is not. Um, but then individually, many people do claim that remdesivir seems to be working in many of the patients. Provided it's given in the initial phase when the antiviral phase the, when the viral is dominating, not in the very late phase where the patient is already intubated and he's doing, um, you know, he's already got severe ARDS. At that time, the antivirals may not be beneficial. The tocilizumab, um, a lot, some studies showed that it is beneficial, but um, when it came to the randomized controlled trials, the, the thing is conflicting again. So the Indian guidelines as given by the national um, guidelines, what they are suggesting is key, you can use it, but it is used only in patients in the more later stages when the interleukin 6 levels are high, the C-reactive protein ferritin is high, very high inflammation is there, and the patient seems to be deteriorating. Uh, as far as the convalescent plasma is concerned, uh, many studies, um, you can see they are generally small studies, but then uh, there are a huge number of studies that I've got. Uh, but the big problem with all the studies is the time when they're giving is not the time when the, you know, um, is the correct time to use antiviral measure. I told you the antiviral, when you're using convalescent plasma, you're giving antibodies that will neutralize the virus. For that, the virus should be there. And the initial phase when the virus was there, at that time, they did not give convalescent plasma. They gave it in the very late stage. And in the late stage, anyway, the virus is down and the patient himself caused had antibodies against it. At that time, using this was not going to benefit. No wonder then we saw the studies did not show benefit. As I told you, the timing is critical in the management of these patients. So particularly stage two is the ideal time to use convalescent plasma, remdesivir, 
the antiviral measures. Obviously, antiviral measures can be used in the initial viral phase, but most of them are not needed because majority of the times the patient is going to recover on his own. So there's no benefit. So you do see, I'm showing in some of the slides, hydroxychloroquine, zinc and all. That is what is given in the national guidelines. But then um, study-wise, I'll show you, uh, it does not seem to be beneficial. Anyway, one thing we understand is key, if something is beneficial or not, it's conflicting, at least see the safety for it. If it's safe, maybe you can give it. Whether it works or not, we don't know. But definitely it should be safe at least. We should not be causing harm in the first place. So there's a huge uh, ev evaluation done by Mayo and Mayo evaluated more than 20,000 hospitalized patients and concluded that convalescent plasma at least is safe and there's no problem with that. So definitely ABO compatibility has to be done. You can go up to 400 ml, that is two doses can be given 24 hours apart, each time 200 ml plasma is given. So definitely safety wise at least it is found to be safe. Now benefit is RCTs are not showing any benefit in plasma. The new thing that has started, especially after Trump told that he took Regneron and he's feeling young and all kinds of things. So basically it, it generated a lot of interest uh, both in the press as well as in the discussions ki how good is, are these uh, antibody cocktail and the Regneron that is there. It's these antibodies are targeting the spike protein. Now, um, we don't have official studies published in any journal. This is released by the press and they are showing benefit. So it, time will tell whether these um, antibodies are going to be useful in the treatment for SARS-CoV-2. And as of now, we don't have clear studies published on it. So obviously the monoclonal antibodies are going to benefit in the antiviral time. Definitely not in the late stage, as I told you, when the cytokine storm is occurring. Hydroxychloroquine, the current guidelines, both NIH and uh, Infectious Disease Society of America, both are saying HCQ should not be used. And at least there's no benefit as of now. Only place where you're allowed to use it is in patients who are in clinical trial. So initial studies were promising that HCQ was beneficial, but randomized controlled trials tested everything. Post-exposure prophylaxis did not show any difference. Early treatment, HCQ did not show any treatment. In hospitalized patients, recovery trial did not show any benefit. As you can see, the graphs are close by and the p-value is not statistically significant, meaning that in all these cases, it was not found to be beneficial. So obviously, SARS-CoV-2 um, is going to enter wherever the AC2 receptors are. So not only the lung and the upper respiratory tract, the GI, the, the cardia, the uh, CNS, all are targets. And a lot of extrapulmonary manifestations are seen. Um, you have the neurological manifestations in which you have headache, dizziness, encephalopathy, uh, obviously loss of uh, smell, I told you already. Uh, stroke is something that is coming up as a big problem in patients with um, SARS-CoV-2. Renal, most common problem is acute kidney injury to a lot of reasons. Partly it could be because of the dehydration. We tend to keep patients who are having ARDS on a drier state, um, don't want to give too much fluids and flood the lung. So to some extent, we are doing dehydration, but at the same time, the virus itself is uh, responsible for creating damage to the lung, uh, to the kidney directly. Part of it is could be because of our drugs. You know that remdesivir, for example, we don't use it if the creat value is less than, I mean, the creat clearance is less than 30. Um, so part of it is the drugs. So there are multiple reasons why renal damage is occurring. And in uh, there are some proteinuria, hematuria, that means glomerular involvement is there, and that is mainly found to be FSGS type. Increased transaminases, but usually in most of these patients, transaminases are not more than five times. Being a hypoxia-driven problem, mitochondrial toxicity is what we expected. No wonder then AST is higher than ALT in most of these patients. We do see bilirubin, but not very high. GIT, again, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, anorexia, all these things are common. Thromboembolic problems are a big issue, and they are the reason why you see multiple organs getting affected. Cardiac, a variety of cardiac problems, the most common of all these is acute cardiac injury with increasing troponin. And any patient who has got SARS-CoV-2, I mean COVID-19, with increased troponin is bad news. And studies are clearly showing that once the heart is affected, the mortality significantly climbs. Diabetes is a big issue. Many people who are not diabetic earlier are turning out to be diabetic. Once they pick up, that is pre-diabetic patients are transforming rapidly into type 2 diabetes. You know, normally pre-diabetes lasts for years before they convert into diabetes. That is the HbA1c crosses 6.5. But we are seeing that once they pick up the, the uh, COVID-19, they are transforming rapidly into diabetes from pre-diabetes. And a lot of new diabetic patients are being picked up. And one of the reasons why they are saying is that the virus might involve the beta cells itself and cause inflammation. A lot of dermatological problems are seen in SARS-CoV-2, petechiae, liver reticularis, rash, urticaria, vesicles, all these things are described. So just to run through the cardiac manifestations, 
problem is mainly hypoxia because of the lung disease any hypoxia will cause reflex tachycardia and that tachy is putting a load imagine if patient already had coronary arteries which are partially blocked the load on the heart now because of the hypoxia is going to precipitate ischemic events and the patient can have a demand supply mismatch resulting in acute cardiac injury the other thing we are seeing is myocarditis initially we thought myocarditis is very common but now we are understanding that the acute patient myocarditis may not be so much but in the patient post cardiac sequelae later two months later one month later we are seeing one of myocarditis definitely very common but in the acute patient at least autopsy studies are showing that uh, the myocarditis may not be that much of an issue actually the myocardial damage is mainly because of the vessel blockage because patho studies did not show lymphocytic infiltrates of my myocardium what we typically see in viral myocarditis obviously the um, thromboembolic state blocking already partially occluded coronary arteries atherosclerosis already there on top of the thromboembolic phenomena blocking the vessels more can precipitate myocardial infarction so a combination of these things are there so as i told you it's a demand ischemia problem patient can develop acute coronary syndrome that is st elevated myocardial infarction myocarditis can occur and uh, stress induced because the stress in this condition in some patients is severe and uh, you see some people before they go to the hospital itself they give up hope and they say meto gaya i'm gone like you know that kind of stress that is there a huge catecholamine load can result in something called takatsubo cardiomyopathy which is also referred to as stress induced cardiomyopathy so these are all the cardiac problems that can occur in this patients although thyroiditis and other endocrine problems have been described but the biggest problem we seeing in covid in endocrine is diabetes the part of it is stress hypoglycemia hyperglycemia part of it is previously undiagnosed diabetes meaning they had they had pre diabetes but they are now being diagnosed as diabetes and people who are already diabetic who are worsening uh, after they develop because the treatment involves steroids and the glucose is going to go up even more so one of the things why a lot of people who are not known diabetics the moment they develop covid 19 and get hospitalized their hb1c is coming high i mean their their sugars are coming very high and they are um, presenting with severe hyperglycemia the reason for that is partly because we now believe that the virus is directly involving the beta cells and causing some inflammation there that's how the transformation from pre diabetes to diabetes seems to be occurring so one thing is for sure any patient who is hyperglycemic and sugars are not controlled appropriately the mortality rates are very high and this is a very high statistically significant scenario so definitely you need to focus on the blood sugar in all patients admitted with covid 19 and uh, the aims protocol aims came up with a manual which i think was very good and what they suggested was mild patients who had mild hyperglycemia the best and safest drugs in um, covid 2 patients are the dpp4 inhibitors what you should be cautious about in using patients who have got mild disease with diabetes is avoid sglt2 inhibitors and paclitazone because sglt2 inhibitors can mask ketoacidosis and uh, it can cause dehydration the other one is paclitazone as you know paclitazone is definitely not a good drug in post cardiac patients or uh, rather who have got edema because it wasn't edema so these two drugs are discouraged what are the best drugs are dpp4 inhibitors you can use metformin but hospitalized patients lactic acidosis can occur with hypoxia you should be cautious about that and sulfonylurea uh, hypoglycemia is an issue that also something you need to take care of so in general dpp4 inhibitors are coming up as a very important management tool in uh, patients with mild disease in diabetes who are basically home quarantine patients who are being managed at home definitely in those patients dpp4 inhibitor with metformin generally is the important formula patients who have got more hyperglycemia definitely then and especially hospitalized patients uh, preferably should be put on basal bolus regimens and their doses are given over here and then in more uncontrolled hyperglycemia patient needs to be started on insulin infusion as i told you clearly studies are showing if the glucose is not controlled the mortality climbs so at discharge most of the patients can be discharged with the drug that they were taking before they develop sars-cov-2 another thing that we are seeing is that diabetic ketoacidosis is coming very common in patients with covid so keep um, alert on this this is mainly because of interleukin 6 and uh, interleukin 6 by these various mechanisms is supposed to significantly increase the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis so these are the guidelines that aims is giving and this is there in the national guidelines um again they are saying in patients who got pre meal post meal less than 140 less than 180 uh, just dietary modification but in people who have got very high glucose anything more than 200 should be carefully titrated with insulin and monitored in hospital patients and if the sugars are more than 140 or 180 
then you have to check the blood sugars repeatedly before breakfast, before lunch, before dinner, and uh, you know, titrate the uh, uh, basal bolus regimens appropriately. The renal manifestations, I told you, the biggest problem is acute kidney injury. And many studies, series after studies, are showing that acute tubular necrosis kind of picture is seen in these patients. We did see glomerular involvement. And in that, mainly it was FSGS that was found. So the virus itself is toxic. That's one part, is, part, e, part of the treatment that we're doing is uh, creating a dehydrated state in order not to flood the lungs. Uh, we are giving less fluid, and so the negative fluid intake is partly creating the problem, and part of it is the toxins that are released by the cells, the rhabdomyolysis that can occur, the uh, uh, superadded infection the patient can pick up. So multiple factors can result in renal injury, and we know that once kidney is involved, then the mortality is going to be very, very high. So the use of dialysis is same in uh, indications for dialysis, just like how we uh, use dialysis for all other conditions. GI manifestations, you'll see anorexia can occur. Uh, that seems to be a very common problem. Anosmia is, again, very common. Nausea, vomiting. The percentage of anosmia is not clear because uh, the studies are showing high variation. Nausea, vomiting, pain, abdomen, diarrhea, all these are seen in patients with. Uh, and uh, usually management is symptomatic. However, uh, patients can have increased transaminases. AST, I told you, slightly higher than ALT. Most patients, is not more than five. If the AST, ALT levels are high, you have to be cautious about using drugs like remdesivir. Um, the um, azithromycin, fe uh, fevipravir, tocilizumab, all these drugs can also increase transaminases, so you should be very cautious and follow the liver enzymes carefully. The neurological manifestations uh, can be many. It can be uh, systemic problems, which can be uh, because of the hypoxia and metabolic encephalopathy can occur. You can see coagulation problem resulting in stroke. You can see inflammation causing encephalopathy and Kawasaki-like uh, multi-organ you know, involvement. You can see um, viral encephalitis can occur, meningitis can occur. Um, then we see um, cell death, that is anosmia. Uh, but this anosmia and all generally does recover about three weeks uh, in majority of patients. An immune-related problem like GBS as a sequelae of viral infection is also described. So multiple problems can occur, and the common ones actually are uh, not that severe. So you have dizziness, headache, most patients, um, but stroke can occur and uh, peripheral nervous system involvement like uh, uh, agiosia, taste sensation affected, anosmia, vision impairment, GBS, these things also can occur. The management of stroke is just like how you see in non-COVID uh, patient stroke. So acute stroke, uh, you do a non-contrast CT. If it's not a hemorrhage, there's definitely a role of using thrombolytic therapy in the first 4.5 hours and up to 24 hours, there is a role of using procedure. The problem with uh, most procedures in the COVID time is difficult. So thrombolytics is the main thing that they are doing in most patients provided the patient comes within 4.5 hours of developing the stroke. So in children, we are seeing um, COVID involvement is comparatively much lesser than what we see in adults. And the reason why in children the disease is supposed to be lesser, many theories are there. No, there's no clear picture, but these are the theories that the uh, strong immunity, innate immunity, possibly because of vaccinations, um, the healthy respiratory tract, the less comorbid conditions, the amount of AC2 receptors in children is supposed to be lesser, and the regenerative capacity in the alveolum is supposed to be better. These are all the reasons why children are not having such severe mortality and severe hospitalizations. In children also, the problems are similar. You see fever, cough, fever and cough, sputum production, rhinorrhea. These are all the common symptoms, just like how we see in the adult. But one interesting thing that started coming out is multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And this multi-system inflammatory syndrome is described in uh, in, in India also, and uh, the CDC definition suggesting that it should be less than 21 years. Fever is an essential feature. Uh, patient should have more than two organs involved and um, should have a past exposure of COVID-19 in the last four weeks. Typically, the uh, MIC occurs about two to four weeks after the uh, exposure to the you know SARS-CoV-2. So this is not uh, like how we see the typical, uh, you know, COVID where the manifestations occur in the first 10 days. Remember here that multi-system inflammatory syndrome is a delayed cytokine problem, and that seems to occur somewhere between two to four weeks. So skin rashes are there. It has features very much like Kawasaki's. So you do see fever, myalgia, conjunctivitis, lymphadenopathy, uh, um, extremity swelling, more or less like how you see in Kawasaki. But you do see a lot of other problems, especially very high inflammatory markers, which we don't see so much in, in Kawasaki's. And you do see the microangiopathy, that is thromboembolic phenomena. And um, myocarditis can occur, raised troponin can occur. Now, if you look at the differences between what you see in MISC and Kawasaki, one is the age itself. 
Typically, the Kawasaki occurs less than five years and usually around two years it peaks and the mean age over here is around 10 to 11 years. Then the severe abdominal pain is a very characteristic feature of MISC. It is less likely to come with severe GI symptoms in Kawasaki. Um, the acute kidney injury is much more common, less likely over here. Myocardial injury can occur in both. So you do see coronary artery aneurysms in Kawasaki that can create a problem. And here also heart damage, I mean, the myocardial damage can occur in a variety of mechanisms. So one major thing is, as I told you, the markers of inflammation are very high in MISC, not so much in Kawasaki. And definitely one of the major differentiators is lymphopenia. It is not a feature of Kawasaki and it is a feature of multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Now, another major difference is Kawasaki, we don't use steroids typically in the management. It's aspirin and immunoglobulin in the management of Kawasaki. Whereas in MIC, we do use IV immunoglobulins and steroids, aspirin, antibiotics, and supportive measures. So obviously one thing is very clear, supportive measure is the mainstay of treatment in SARS-CoV-2 patients. Okay, apart from that, we add these things. Another problem that we're seeing is post-COVID sequelae. So it's just the acute management is not enough now. We are going to have our hands full once this pandemic is over because the residual damage that this virus is leaving behind is significant. So uh, this was a study that showed that, uh, again, this is from Italy, what they showed that at the end of two months, almost half of the patient had some other symptoms. So fatigue, the most common, dyspnea, joint pain, chest pain, cough, anosmia, persisting problems lasting for weeks, even after they recovered from COVID-19. So there's something called what we refer now as long haulers. This is people who are recovered from COVID have some the kind of brain fog. They can't concentrate. They have heart damage. Uh, they have some mental neurological, uh, you know, smoldering effect. So this is even after they recover. And the big problem you're noticing is, uh, especially who had pa patients who had ARDS, once they recover, uh, they were followed up and the pulmonary function test showed that there's a decrease in DLCO and there is a restrictive pattern. So what we are worried about is pulmonary fibrosis. Roughly, they are saying about 5% of patients who develop ARDS due to COV-2, SARS-CoV-2, are going to have pulmonary fibrosis. And this was seen more in these risk factors. And what we are now considering is, is there a role of using um, antifibrotic drugs like perfenidone and nintedanib? in most of Indian patients is out of reach because of the cost. But perfenidone is something that there are some, some places are using it. But then uh, there's no study and there's no trial as of yet because the number of patients are too small to still know whether this is going to work or not. But in most people are clearly understanding that uh, steroids actually are much better than using these drugs. And, um, um, you know, using a tapering dose of steroid for next three to four weeks might be a good idea in patients whom we are worried about severe ARDS and healing with fibrosis. So one of the things people are trying is steroids, but at the, at the same time, you can't put steroids to all patients who are recovering from hospital and being sent home. It is used selectively in patients whom, in whom particularly you are worried about pulmonary fibrosis as marked by a very low DLCO and a restrictive pattern. Already we have seen in India, one lung transplant done in a COVID survivor. So I think the lung problems are gonna be an issue. Another thing we are noticing is cardiovascular sequelae. People who are recovered from COVID are having a um, uh, study showing, particularly MRI was done at 70 days after they recovered from COVID, and they found that these patients uh, had myocarditis. So myocarditis as a sequelae is something that we are going to have problems with that can result in fibrosis. And any fibrosis is a bed for arrhythmias to occur in the future. So neurological problems are seen in patients who are uh, recovered from COVID. and um, the disorientation, poor organized uh, movements. Some patients had uh, MRI suggestive of um, you know mild strokes and critical illness rate encephalopathy is another problem. So a lot of uh, issues, encephalopathy, ischemic stroke, uh, encephalitis, Bell's palsy, rhabdomyolysis, a lot of issues are seen in people who recovered from COVID. A lot of psychiatric manifestations, particularly post-traumatic stress disorder, mood disorders, uh, depression, all these are problems that we are seeing in patients who are recovered from COVID-19. Vascular problems are seen and definitely the risk of thromboembolism is very high in patients who have recovered from COVID-19. In the hospital, obviously we're giving anticoagulation. The question is at discharge, do we need to give? This answer is given by using the um, improved D scoring system. We use the improved D scoring at the time of discharge to decide the patient should be put on oral anticoagulants for six weeks or not. And uh, if you find this score is fulfilled, then that patient or generally people who have got very high D-dimer, those patients end up on anticoagulation. You can even use a newer oral anticoagulant agents at the time of discharge. Uh, and this is also being studied now about what's the risk of developing thrombosis after the patient recovered from COVID. 
So ultimately, what we're understanding is definitely the prevention is better than cure. So wearing a mask, social distancing, hand washing, this is going to be the mainstay. And no doubt the cases are going on increasing. If you don't want to flood the hospitals because the number of ventilators are that much only. So you, the reason why we talk about bending the curve is we need to keep the cases lesser and not all of them to be involved at the same time. Ultimately, this virus is going to spread. Most people will get exposed to it, but then we want them to get involved slowly so that we don't flood the hospitals and we don't uh, compromise the you know capacity of the healthcare system. So this is the reason why uh, the social distancing is going to play a very important role. So I think I'll conclude here and uh, thank you again for a patient listening.